Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the workshop. Let me give a few introductory words for, uh, before starting the workshop. So this IBS ISTP workshop on external light particles is an uh, annual program between the uh, IBS CTPU and ISTP particle theory group. Originally, we, of course, we intended uh, to be an offline meeting, but from the last year, we had to have it online. But as I remember, the last year workshop was great. We could learn a lot from excellent talks and discussion. So I hope that this year also, this workshop uh, will serve as a collect, uh, collaborative environment to facilitate uh, fruitful discussions among active researchers in this field. And um, because of the time zone issue, the workshop cannot be too long. And we had to be very selective on topics. But I believe that uh, all the speakers will talk about some important or interesting recent progress in the physics of axions. So uh, today we are going to start with the discussion of the recent experimental progress in axion searches. And our first speaker is Dr. Ong Kim from the IBS CAP, another IBS group uh, on the action, experimental action search. Um, and he's going to tell us a uh, storage ring action EDM experiment using an RF beam filter. Uh, and, and let me say this so, any of the audience can uh, interrupt during the talk if you have a question. And uh, if there are too many interruptions, uh, so you, you just turn on a uh, microphone and ask your questions if you have uh, any. If there are too many interruptions, then I can coordinate. Yeah, so let's just start. Okay, so Dr. On, please start. Oh, okay, let me share my screen. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Thank you for the nice introduction. Um, so uh, this is, uh, I, I'm, my name is On Kim. I'm, I'm also, uh, uh, I'm, I'm in the Center for Axion and Precision Physics in IBS. And today I'm gonna talk about the, this, uh, my recent work on the storage ring Axion EDM experiment using an RF beam filter. Um, as uh, Dr. Sang already said, I'm I'm happy to be uh, interrupted during my talk because uh, it, uh, specifically I can't see uh, at the raised hands during my talk when I'm sharing my screen. So please feel free to interrupt me whenever you have any question or comment. Uh, I also want to appreciate the organizers to have me here. It's really wonderful uh, to give a talk in this workshop. Okay, let me begin. Uh, uh, I, I actually have very concise uh, contents for my talk. Uh, first, I, I want to briefly overview the concept of the storage ring axion EDM method. And then I, I move on to this uh, new idea, recently proposed idea to, using, to use an RF beam filter to, um, as another method to search for the axion induced uh, EDM. And uh, I'm going to also briefly talk about the the studied systematic effects and the projected statistical sensitivity of the uh, ex experiment. So this is actually the conceptual work, and uh, I'm not going to show you show you the. I mean, the, the experiment is not not being done. I mean, it's uh, it's in a proposal. So we are going to uh, just focus on the conceptual uh, the the part of this idea, and 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 the work. Okay, let me begin with the, the first part. So I want to briefly uh, show you the overview of the storage ring EDM or Axion EDM uh, method. Uh, I mean, of course, many of you are already very familiar with the Axion. This is start from the uh, strong CP problem. So why the uh, CP violating phase theta in the QCD Lagrangian is so small uh, so that the upper limit uh, that is determined by the experiment, the many state-of-the-art experiments are uh, discovered, I mean, uh, shown have shown that this upper limit of the theta is around order of 10 to minus 10 uh, from the neutron EDM experiments. 
uh, if this is a uh, really an order of one from this because this is uh, naturally from zero to two pi, then the neutron EDM should be around an uh, order of 10 to minus 16 electron centimeter. But the latest uh, EDM measurement that was published last year actually uh, showed, the, showed the upper limit of the EDM of the neutron uh, is around 10 to minus 26 electron centimeter. So uh, this figure shows you the neutron electric dipole moment experiments from 1950. So for decades, it really improved by a lot. You can see first it was like 10 to minus 19 electron centimeter, but now we have 10 to minus 26, so order of seven uh, magnitudes, which is tremendous amount of improvement. But still there is uh, some gap uh, between our the, the current uh, measured value and the what's predicted in the standard model. So to resolve this strong CP problem, Pechai and Queen proposed a new uh, U1 symmetry in 1977. So this uh, Pechai Queen symmetry, when you spontaneously break broken uh, the symmetry, then induces a dynamical pseudo-scalar field, and it's called stone boson, it's called axion. And this famous tilted Mexican head potential figure shows you how to uh, how I mean describes how axion uh, acquires mass. And axion is not very fascinating. I mean, it's a very fascinating uh, and strongly motivated particle beyond the standard model, not only because it resolved the strong CP problem, but also it's, it can be a, a candidate. It is a candidate of the dark matter. So axions or axion-like particles can constitute some or all of the dark matter so, it, so that we can call that axion-like dark matter. Uh, to search for axion, there we, we have to seek for searching the, the interactions uh, between the axion and the standard model particle that we can detect. Uh, so in general, there are three sorts of the axion standard model couplings. Uh, probably the most famous one would be the axion uh, photon coupling, which can be represented in this GA gamma gamma coupling constant. This is uh, electromagnetic interaction and uh, there are many efforts, uh, experimental efforts to uh, search for uh, in this search for axion photon coupling in this wide uh, parameter space of the axion. So um, specific, I mean, there there are some um, efforts uh, to use the the resonant cavities. Um, to amplify the, the signal of the axion to photon conver conversion uh, that is called a heliscope, or, or for the solar axion, there is a helioscope, and also there is a lab produced axion, like light shining through water. I can't, I can't uh, name all the experiments that is being done or have done in this area, but there are really many uh, efforts going on, which can be seen in this figure, for example. And the second type of the uh, interaction would be the axion fermion interaction. Uh, this is a spin dependent force. So when there is a gradient of the axion field, then you can couple with the spin of the fermion. And uh, particularly this uh, figure in the middle shows one of the uh, experiment, it's called Ariadne. Um, this is also trying to detect the, the this signal from the uh, interaction between the monopore and dipole, uh, and and the ex where the axion field is the mediator of this spin-dependent force. So its gradient changes while this uh, the tungsten source is rotating, and it uh, drives the spin-dependent force on the on the source. Uh, sorry, the target here, and there we detect the some magnetic field by the squid, for example. So. Yeah, this kind of uh, interaction can also, um, there, there are a lot of efforts going on. Can't name all of the experiments, of course. And the third category is uh, the particularly what I'm interested in and I'm gonna talk in this uh, presentation. So this is the EDM related interaction. So uh, we can call it a GEDM the coupling constant, and there is axion field, and also it's a, a spin interaction with the electric field. And 
because the axion is a dynamical field and it's related with the a theta in the QCD Lagrangian, so there can be a coupling to the EDM that is oscillating uh, with the axion frequency. Um, to, to the best of my knowledge, there are only two efforts going on to search for this uh, coupling, which one is the neutron EDM experiment that is actually being done very recently last year. Uh, they analyzed it when there is an axion EDM coupling, then uh, it can just, it excluded some, some parameter space of the axion. And also the storage ring EDM collaboration can also uh, do the experiment that is sensitive to this coupling that I'm gonna talk about right now. So uh, the storage ring EDM, um, so before I go into the Axion EDM experiment, uh, let me just briefly show, review the storage ring EDM uh, concept. So the motivation is manifest. I mean, we, we have uh, like around 10 to fifth gaps between the, the current measured neutron EDM upper limit and the, what's predicted in the standard model. And there are a wide range of the interested region between the, uh, our, our current upper limit and the standard model prediction uh, where the various models of the new physics beyond the standard model can jump in to explain uh, if the EDM is found in this range. Uh, so this is uh, another figure uh, of the EDM upper limit uh, as a function of year of publication. And it seems like there are some measurements that already covered this uh, range up to 10 to minus 30, but actually these uh, purple triangles are mercury and, and it's a uh, neutron equivalent should be around, not, not exceeding this 10 to minus 26. So that our current understanding for uh, the neutron EDM upper limit is around 10 to minus 26. And this yellow triangle is for electron. So the storage ring EDM method can be sensitive to up to uh, 10 to minus 29 electron centimeter, according to the uh, proposal of the storage ring EDM collaboration. This is a really amazing thing because we can constrain the theta QC, uh, or the CP violin theta by three more orders of magnitudes. And also, uh, as I mentioned, this range is sensitive to various PSM models and uh, typically, if there is a new physics, then it is sensitive to the, the mass of the new physics scale of around 10 or 100 tera, tera electron volt. And this 10 to, minus, 10 to minus 29 electron centimeter is really, really tiny value. Of course, 10 to minus 26 is also very precise and tiny value. But if you, it's hard to imagine how small it is. So, so if you look at this figure in the right hand side, uh, there is a, a proton, which is around one femtometer size. Uh, and if you, um, in, if, you, if you expand the size of the proton to the, the size of Earth, which then corresponds 10 to 22 femtometer, then you're seeking to find the, the charge separation less than 10 micrometer. So this is really unprecedented uh, precision. Uh, in, in intensity frontier experiments. So the storage ring EDM method uh, is as follows. So you, you store the charged particle like proton or jitron in the storage ring and you circulate this particle and the blue arrow represent the momentum of the particle and the red arrow represent the spin of the particle. And, and there is a, if there is an EDM and and if we have a, if we meet some specific condition where the spin is frozen to the momentum of the particle, then we know that spin should grow upward vertically out of plane. So that can be seen from this equation actually. So this is what's called Thomas BMT equation. This describes the spin precession frequency. Um, omega A is the spin precession frequency and there are a lot, a lot of terms, but if you store this particle in the electric ring, then there you, you cancel out this, those terms in related to the magnetic field. And also there is a specific condition called magic momentum that cancels this uh, term in the bracket. So the, the remaining term is only this term and you, you, you simplify 
uh, this omega a uh, just proportional to the EDM. So this uh, magic momentum value for proton, for example, is 0.7 GB. Um, and then, and then this uh, this omega a uh, will make the spin grow upward, or I mean vertical direction out of plane, and and then the, it can be detected by the polarimeter. So if the beam is uh, beam is being scattered after hitting this uh, polarimeter target, and we collect the number of particle that is uh, arrived to the detector. Um, there is a, a mechanism how 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 it um, derives asymmetry in the detector. So when the beam is uh, being scattered to the target, there is a Stern-Gerlau force. Uh, so this beam has a spin, and it couples with the magnetic field that is generated by the the atom in this target. And if the spin is uh, not along the direction of the momentum, then there is a gradient uh, S dot B so that um, it, it drives the asymmetry. Uh, if, the, if the spin is in the vertical direction, then it drives asymmetry in the left or right hand side. And if the spin is in the radial direction in plane, then it drives asymmetry in up, upward or downward uh, detector. Um, but we, we I already mentioned that the, for the EDM signal, the spin grows in vertical direction. So we are interested in the asymmetry in left and right hand side. So left right asymmetry epsilon can be defined as following, where P is the polarization of the beam and the A is the analyzing power. Uh, so for, for example, I brought some numbers for the uh, experimental sensitivity that is uh, proposed by the storage ring EDM collaboration. So to achieve 10 to minus 29 electron centimeter centi sensitivity, uh, we need, for example, the eight megavolt per meter electric field in a storage ring. And there should be an order of 10 to 10 particle number of particles stored and uh, the total experimental time of 10 to seven seconds and the spin coherence time, which, is, which tells you how long um, the beam conserves this polarization. Uh, this spin coherence time should be around 10,000 seconds. Yeah. And there are many systematic effects that should be suppressed because this is really high precision experiment. And so you have to understand the systematic effects really well and have it well controlled. Uh, so the four CDM signal, for example, can be driven by many reasons like the field errors, the radial B field, vertical electric field or geometrical phase by the motion of the beam. Uh, those kind of many, many things are, can be suppressed by storing counter rotating beams. So if you uh, store one beam of the particle uh, rotating clockwise of the beam and the other counterclockwise of the beam, then their EDM effect would be, EDM signal is opposite uh, while the, their systematic signal is having the same sign. So if you subtract one from another, then you affect the, obtain the effect from the pure EDM signal. And, and also it's more suppressed, the systematic effects are more suppressed by utilizing some uh, innovative lattice design, like hybrid uh, electric and magnetic field and the symmetric uh, design uh, these are or like the recently um, being developed uh, that you can see from these references. And, and for example, this shows the four CDM signal with the original ring design uh, that is uh, far beyond the, the target sensitivity. But if you implement this symmetric design, then this can be suppressed be, uh, below this target sensitivity. So those kind of efforts are really um, being done these days. Uh, and, and now let's just turn our attention to the uh, using the storage ring EDM method for probing axion-like dark matter. So uh, I, I briefly mentioned that the ARP fields that is dynamically oscillating, this can induce the oscillating nucleon EDM uh, from this coupling. So we have, uh, we end up having this uh, EDM of the nucleon uh, oscillating as a frequency of the axion, axion frequency. And we can just write down like this, 
the, the nucleon EDM is uh, proportional to the axion field, RP field, and there is some coupling constant. For if this was a QCD axion dark matter, then and also assuming that this makes up 100% of, of the local dark matter, then uh, it's, it's given as following. Uh, it's the magnitude is around 10 to minus 34 electron centimeter oscillating with axion frequency. Uh, and storage ring EDM method can be a fascinating candidate to search for this oscillating EDM because it has high sensitivity, as I told you, uh, like 10 to minus 29 electron centimeter. And also it can search for like relatively low mass regions, uh, less than micro electron volts. And also it can be parasitically done while doing the conventional static EDM experiments. So these are really nice features of the uh, implementing storage ring EDM method uh, to seek for oscillating EDM. So I also just briefly uh, show you the measurement principle. Uh, I, I, I brought this equation again. Uh, so this is a spin precession frequency equation and with, with respect to the momentum. And there are two terms in the front uh, that is uh, determined by the, they're related to G here, where G is uh, uh, defined as G minus two over two, G is the G factor. <clears throat> so, so these are uh, related to the magnetic dipole moment of the particle. And that's the reason why this is called G minus two precession. Uh, because to store the charged particle, we know that the electric field should pointing toward the center of the storage ring in radial plane. And the magnetic field should point the vertical direction. So we, we know that this, should uh, induce spin precess in plane. And for the EDM case, uh, on the other hand, um, where this eta is the unitless EDM, which you can see from here, uh, now this induces spin to precess uh, in vertical direction, so out of plane. Uh, so if you look closer in the particle rest frame, <clears throat> This, uh, the first case is uh, the, the frozen spin case uh, when there is a zero G minus two precession. So when, when the, these first two terms are, are null, then the spin is frozen uh, with respect to the momentum. And there is a, a EDM precession frequency, a EDM precession vector here. So the spin just uh, monotonically grow in this direction, in vertical direction. But when there is G minus two precession, so when there is a, a G minus two precession vector like this, then this spin precesses in plane and the effect of this EDM precession will be canceled, canceled out. But if there is an oscillating EDM field with, uh, uh, sorry, oscillating EDM induced by the um, axion like dark matter. And, and if there is a resonance uh, when, uh, the G minus two frequency is uh, precisely the same with the axion frequency. Then if you, if you take a snapshot uh, at the at time equals zero, uh, the spin is pointing this direction. And at the time of the, the half period of the G minus two uh, precession, then the spin will flip, it will point the opposite direction. And at the same time, the EDM precession angular frequency vector would also flip its uh, direction to the other uh, direction because now this uh, omega EDM contains eta and that's, this eta is oscillating as a function of time. And if there, there, there is a resonance, uh, the G minus frequency and the axion frequency is the same, then it will drive, drive the resonance and the spin will uh, continuously monotonically grow up. So for example, this is the figure that uh, represent this uh, feature. So the spin uh, experienced the G minus two precession and at the same time it grows in the vertical direction. So that is the concept and, and it can be measured by the parameter. Uh, so the left right asymmetry is the, are observable and this is, uh, for example, the simulation, how it looks like this is the left right asymmetry as a function of time. And there is a uh, slope, which is uh, from the vertical spin slope uh, getting piled up. So, and, and there are some 
there could be some question why there's, there are small error bars at the early and the late time. That's intended because we, we can take more fractions of the statistics at earlier time to induce the, some intra-beam scattering. This is a, some technical point uh, that we, to reduce the systematics. And, and the, the late time, we, we can also take more fractions at the late time to improve the fit sensitivity. I'm gonna uh, get back to this point at the later slides. And, and, and the, because we don't know where, where the axion is, where, what is its mass, so we have to scan uh, the axion frequency or axion mass by, by scanning, by sweeping the G minus frequency, because the resonance condition is when the G minus frequency is the same with the axion frequency. So for example, this is a simulation plot where, where, where uh, the vertical axis is the spin vertical component as a function of time. There is a resonance at the middle. And if you draw the G minus frequency as a function of time, then it uh, just uh, it linearly uh, changes. And when, when it just be same uh, uh, with the axiom mass, so the resonance happens at this point, precisely at this point, then the resonance happens. So we can seek for the signal like when the asymmetry jumps up from, from this flat one point and the later point, then there is uh, a signal between these two frequencies. Uh, actually, this experiment was uh, partially done in COSI, uh, Germany in 2019. And one of the three principal investigators are in the uh, IBS CAPP. Uh, data is currently under analysis. So this is the experimental scheme of this uh, uh, axion EDM experiment. The target was uh, around 0.5 nanoelectron volt. And, and this is the, the momentum, how, how do we change the momentum and, and how, how they did the uh, experiment. Uh, and also, uh, if I can digress a little bit, there is another point of view that to, to use this storage ring EDM method for probing dark matter and dark energy, um, not only this uh, GEDM coupling, we can also utilize this axion fermion direction GAFF through uh, this uh, gradient of A dot S. Um, so the, the main breakthrough of this uh, concept is that if you use storage ring, then the particle we store are highly relativistic. Their, their beta is uh, almost the same as the speed of light. So this gradient A that is seen by the particle enhances by a large factor because, because we, are, we are doing just a laboratory experiment uh, with a stationary uh, apparatus, then uh, our relative speed with the dark matter is order of 10 to minus three, the beta. But, but for this particle, they, these are one. So there is a large factor of enhancement. Um, but you can uh, certainly look into this uh, paper more to understand this uh, interesting paper. But this is uh, certainly not the scope of my talk. So let me just go into the details of the, the new method using the RFV inverter. So uh, this idea is uh, proposed last year. And um, uh, it started from the, the axion EDM concept. So search for our dark matter using this storage ring EDM method is uh, promising and very fascinating. But there are some technical difficulties to scan wide range of the uh, axion mass. Because uh, the resonance condition is when the G minus two frequency is the same with the axion mass. But Scanning this G minus two frequency in wide range is uh, technically hard because um, the G minus frequency for in the, for example, in a magnetic ring, it can be represented in this equation where, where Q and M are just constant, G is also constant and you, you have this magnetic field. So you have to change magnetic field to change the G minus two frequency. And, and also this is the condition that you store in the particle P equals QBR that so if you i mean you can't change the radius of the storage ring so r should be constant and 
So that means to change the magnetic field, then you have to change the momentum. And there are certain uh, limit that you can change the momentum in the storage ring. So um, we, we investigated if there could be any other degree of freedom to tune, tune this resonance. So, uh, so if you look at this figure, I mean, it's radio. <clears throat> There are three knobs, for example, there are some continuous tuning knobs and the second there's uh, some discrete tuning knobs uh, to, to let you choose uh, FM, AM, other things. And there's a volume. So I thought that maybe the volume can be um, like tuning the statistics to, to go from the larger statistics. And this uh, second knob is like a rather discrete G minus two frequency because we have like limited uh, capability of choosing this G minus two frequency, but we can continuously tune uh, the the other frequency by introducing some some um, RF electromagnetic field. That's the idea uh, of the introducing the new element, uh, the RF VIN, VIN filter. Uh, the the VIN filter is a perfect can candidate as a source of RF electromagnetic fields. This is the schematic of the VIN filter, for example. Because the, the VIN filter does not exert Lorentz force on the particle in a, having you know, some specific momentum. Uh, so it not only has one of the electrical magnetic fields, but, but it has both in perpendicular direction so that the Lorentz force uh, exerted on the particle cancels out. So uh, it only affects spin, not beam dynamics. And that's the precisely the reason why it's called actually the filter because it filters out the the momentum other than the the target momentum. But we can utilize this feature of the beam filter in to to induce the spin resonance. So if we just uh, briefly revisit the the spin dynamics, then um, you can write down the vertical spin component differential equation as following. This is the vertical spin uh, time derivative. Uh, it's given like this, and there is an EDM signal. This is omega eta is the EDM precession frequency. Now it's a function of time because EDM is oscillating. And, and, and you can arrive to this uh, relation uh, where the WF stands for VIN filter, and A VIN, A VIN filter is nothing but just uh, VIN filter strength. Uh, in, in a unit of the angular frequency. So if you analyze this expression, then if you want to, tar if you want to target the conventional uh, static EDM, then there are two resonance conditions. Uh, without the wind filter, it's manifest that the resonance condition is the G minus frequency equals to zero, which is precisely the frozen spin case. And when there is the wind filter, then these two frequencies should be identical to each other. And this is actually already uh, studied in this article. And if you target the oscillating EDM induced by the axon like dark matter, then there are also a two resonance condition. One, one is the when G minus two frequency is same with the axion frequency without the beam filter. This, is, this was uh, what I was being talking about. And this uh, new idea is that the re new resonance condition can happen when the G minus two frequency is either at the side bands of the beam filter frequency and the axion frequency. So if you summarize this in the table like this, then you have this table. There are four items. Uh, they have different targets. For example, the first two columns are targeting the DC EDM and the resonance conditions are following and their uh, EDM slope, EDM signal is following. You can find the references. And there is a, a axion EDM experiment at the two last columns. This is the, the one I've been talking about. And the last item is this work. Uh, there are, there are the, the, the coefficients that I uh, just called C beam filter. Uh, this is just uh, the factor that we have to multiply because the beam filter driven resonance is uh, slightly weaker than just the uh, uh, EDM uh, resonance. So this actually turns out to be a Bessel function. So this, the maximum of this coefficient is around 0.6. Uh, 
Uh, so I, uh, we did some numerical verifications using the high precision spin tracking simulation. Uh, I mean, for the, um, the spin dynamic equation that I showed, I, that there are all just approximated equations just to, uh, just to do the analytical estimation. But for the simulation, we don't have those approximation. So there are no approximation in the Lawrence Force equation or Thomas BMT equation and we integrate with a extremely high precision. And uh, the first result I'm showing, this is the, the, the spin vertical component without the wind filter. Uh, and there are two curves. Um, the blue one is when there is only static EDM and the orange curve is when there is uh, only um, oscillating EDM. You, you can see their, their sh shape is quite, uh, quite different. From each other, and if you free analyze this uh, spin oscillation, then you have this clear peaks. And for for the static EDM case, there is a peak at the G minus two frequency. That's also one reason to see why that the resonance happens at the when the condition is G minus two frequency equals to the maximum frequency. And for the oscillating EDM case, there are two peaks: one at the axion frequency minus and uh, G minus frequency and the other at the plus. So the, these are two sidebands with the axiom frequency and G minus two frequency. And, and it turns out the, the lower frequency is the more sensitive. So if you apply the wind filter uh, at this uh, specific frequency on resonance, then we, we get this uh, nice um, resonance on the vertical spin component. So it grows up or down monotonically. Uh, so that it accumulates uh, as time goes on, then we can detect the left-right asymmetry in polarimeter data. Uh, also, uh, we did some um, numerical verification when the, the beam filter occupies only a fraction of the storage ring because all those analytical calculation that I uh, presented was done when assuming the beam filter is occupying or fraction or uh, part of the storage ring, which is not practical, of course. So the spin tracking simulation was done with this realistic condition. And uh, this legend showed the, the, the occupancy. So when it, uh, when it occupies all part of the storage ring, you, you show the spin vertical component uh, in blue. Uh, when it occupies only 10%, it's orange. They're all, almost uh, one, one tenth of the difference and, and it go, goes to 1%, there's only one tenth. Uh, so it, it kind of consistent with the expectation. Okay, so the, that brings me to the last part of my talk, which is I want to talk about the systematic effects and the statistical sensitivity. Um, so as I, I mean, it's, it's a very, very hard to understand all systematic effects, but uh, we really need to do this to, to conduct the really high precision experiments. And for the frozen spin uh, storage ring EDM experiments, the, the main dominant systematic effect is from the field errors, like the radial magnetic field or vertical electric field. But for the storage ring EDM uh, using the wind filter, um, there was also the um, systematic effects um, when there is a small misalignment of the beam filter. So imagine that the beam filter should um, point this axis in black. So the electric field of a beam filter is supposed to point this X axis and the magnetic field of the beam filter is supposed to point this um, Y axis. But if there is a small misalignment oh, and it's tilted like this in theta, uh, then uh, it suffers the systematic effects uh, and its effect is huge. Uh, so if you look at this figure, this is a systematic force EDM signal um, as a function of different wind filter strength. And this is only when the misalignment angle is one, one microradian. Um, but if you look at the scale of the force EDM signal, it corresponds to an order of 0.1 radian per second. 
this is a really a large amount of the force EDM signal because the typical pure EDM signal should be an order of nano radian per second. So this is really serious uh, systematic effect that we have to take into account. But if you introduce a, a RF wind filter, and, and if you change the, this resonance condition uh, to this sidebands between the wind filter frequency and the axiom frequency, then now it's uh, kind of avoid the, that systematic effect. So this plot is now uh, the spin vertical component as a function of time with the, the misalignment of the bin filter. So, so there are four, four colors. Uh, the blue is when there is a no misalignment, this is the ideal case. And the orange is when the misalignment is one microradian and so on. You can see there are, there are larger and larger fluctuations if you increase the uh, amount of the misalignment, but the average slope doesn't change. And that's what's important because uh, eventually what we are gonna see is from the parameter data. And, and we, will, we want to extract the slope, not the individual fluctuation at, the, at each point. At the average slope is what we want and it doesn't change. Uh, so that's a good thing. And another thing is the field errors uh, because we can't really free from those small field errors in storage ring experiments. Uh, um, and, and there are some simulation study done um, um, by artificially um, introducing some random field errors and order of one PPM. And you can see those uh, uh, the, the average slope again didn't change much. There are some fluctuations, of course, but in the long term they they dies out. So and also in general, if there is there is a a signal that we we can't we, we don't know if if it's true or not yet, uh, then we can actually do another experiment targeting the same axion frequency, but by readjusting the wind filter frequency and the G minus two frequency. This is really good feature of introducing another degree of freedom because we can self-confirm whether this is really a true EDM signal or a false EDM signal. Um, and let me now tell you about the uh, statistical sensitivity estimation. On the, the statistical sensitivity uh, of the EDM, uh, which I, I wrote down as a sigma d, can be written as this equation uh, in presence of the beam filter. So there are some modifications. Uh, and putting the idea experimental conditions, uh, you, you, can, you can see this number is around 10 to minus 30 electron centimeter, which is really, really precise, but um, there are some uh, factors uh, we need to take into account. So, so before I mention that, I, I'll just tell you, remind you what those vectors are. So the first one is a spin. So I will assume the proton here. And this uh, P, is, P naught is the initial polarization. So almost 80%. And this the A is the analyzing power. This is related to the polarimeter and it depends on the energy. And the, the E asterisk is the effective E field. So um, uh, this is defined as E naught minus V B naught, where the E and B are the electric and magnetic field in the storage ring. And this is the beam filter coefficient that I mentioned. And there is a parameter efficiency, which is uh, around 1%. And the number of particles per each cycle is 10 to 11. And the total experiment time, uh, I just uh, set it as a standard one year. And the spin coherence time, uh, tau p or tau sct uh, is 1,000 seconds. So uh, if you look at this, the 100 megavolt per meter uh, really contributed a lot to improve this sensitivity. And this is possible because we can now use the magnetic field, not only the electric field. So for the highly relativistic particle, it's, it, it is, uh, uh, it's feasible because one Tesla of the magnetic field for highly relativistic particle uh, is equivalent as much as 300 megavolt per meter electric field. Um, so how, how do we estimate this statistical 
uh, sensitivity and how did we actually improve by a factor of two? There are two factors that we consider. One is optimizing the single measurement time and the other is weighting the data, data taking. The single measurement time uh, is actually predominantly limited by the spin coherence time. So typically it, it makes you think that the longer you take the data, the better, right? But uh, this is true when you do only single measurement. But, if, but this is not true if you do the multiple measurements and if you want to spend the total experimental time most efficiently. So this is like uh, analytically given by uh, the just a linear fit minimizing the chi-square. Uh, this is the statistical sensitivity. And numerically, it is optimized when t is equal to 1.5 uh, spin coherence time. But if you do the repeated measurements, and if you just change this n total to n cycle times the total experimental time divided by the single measurement time, then you find the, the, the optim, optimum measurement, single measurement time is around 0.7 single uh, spin coherence time. You can see from this figure as well. And the other factor uh, we can consider is that we want to weight the data taking. Uh, Essentially, we seek for non-zero asymmetry as an EDM signal. Uh, and this theta is the spin slope, uh, sorry, the spin vertical component, and it grows over time uh, when there is an EDM, oscillating EDM, and if you know, on resonance. Then um, it's better to have large statistics, at, large statistics at later time than the earlier time. And as an extreme limit, uh, consider take all statistics at the later time t. This is a single measurement time. Uh, then it, it already enhances the sensitivity by around 50%. And if we also consider the repeated measurements, then the optimized single measurement time is around half the spin coherence time. And then you arrive to this uh, equation that I showed. Uh, and this is now the projected uh, statistical sensitivity for the R uh, parameter space. And there are two couplings that uh, we consider one is the, the gluon coupling const, constant here defined in this equation. And this is just a generic uh, EDM coupling. Uh, and I, I, uh, we divided into three categories uh, depending on the different spin coherence time values, because now it is achievable by around thousand seconds for proton, uh, but, uh, uh, but as technology uh, being improved, I, I think we can go go to like 10 to four, or 10 to five in the near term. So that improves the sensitivity by ar around the order of magnitude. So that's included in this uh, features. And there's uh, some kinks uh, over right here uh, where the, the slope of this sensitivity plot um, quickly uh, goes upward. Uh, this is the time when the the measurement time is restricted by uh, axion dark matter Q factor rather than the spin coherence time. So that's the finer uh, sort of result from, from this, for, for this study. And so in summary, um, the storage ring EDM method is a very fascinating candidate, uh, which is applicable to search for axion-like dark matter. Um, our observable is the spin precession, uh, specifically the vertical spin component uh, that grows uh, monotonically. And the projected EDM sensitivity can reach to 10 to minus 29 electron centimeter. I mean, yeah, and if we assume all the ideal conditions, then we can even reach to 10 to minus 30, as I showed. And, and it also is sensitive to relatively low mass regions, less than microelectron volt. And the new experimental concept has been proposed using an RF beam filter. Uh, this uh, enables us to search for a wider scannable range uh, than the previous axion EDM method by altering this, uh, the resonance condition. And, and we've studied the systematic effects and the statistical sensitivity, and it was great to see that the dominant systematic effect from the beam filter misalignment uh, is resolved using this uh, method. And for example, this is this concept of using the RF beam filter is uh, can be realized 
by just adding the ring filter in the existing storage rings, such as Mionjima string in Vermilab, et cetera. So that could be kind of a good proposal, I think. Uh, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your inspiring talk. So now we have a time for questions and comments. Yeah, I think uh, the talk was easy to understand. <laughs> That's great to hear. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, let me see your previous plot, the final plot for the sensitivity yeah, here. So I see uh, uh, before using the RF bin filter, the the storage in uh, experiment sensitivity is uh, centered around the nano electron volt. Is it is it right? Oh no 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 that. that's that's just the one um, um, one experiment um, done in Kazi, uh, but that that's just kind of uh, not the entire experiment, but it was like a proof of concept uh, experiment that was done uh, like a short period of time. And the analysis is ongoing, and and um, ideally it can cover uh, all the ranges that I I shown here. But uh, there is a technical difficulties that I described that you can't really change the G minus to frequency over these wide ranges of the frequency. So uh, so there's no figure uh, to compare your result with theirs here. But uh, uh -huh. how much improvement is made uh, uh, using this uh, another frequency, another, uh -huh. another tuning mode, <laughs> the RF bin filter? Uh, that, that's a that's a good good question. Yeah, uh, you're right. I, I actually didn't brought the figure. Uh, I didn't bring the figure from the the original storage ring axion EDM experiment. I mean, the the sensitivity is comparable to this one, but uh, yeah. I, uh, as I mentioned that. The, the important thing to uh, is that not the not the sensitivity itself for each frequency, but is the providing this this work is providing a mechanism to uh, um, to to cap to increase the capability of scanning the wider range of the frequency using the uh, RF bin filter in the existing storage rings. So I would say the, the sensitivity is comparable. Sensitivity is comparable to these ranges. Yeah. 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 Actually, you can you can look into one of the papers. For example, if you look at this PRD paper that was published in 2019, then you will see the you will see the sensitivity plot and 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 the uh, and it's comparable to this work. Hmm. So, uh, but still, the most interesting parameter point may be action mass of 10 to the minus 6 electron volt, but uh, we lose uh, significantly lose the sensitivity over the mass radio. Why is it so? Because in this resonance condition, uh, if we tuning between G minus 2 frequency and beam filter frequency, then the, the axion frequency can be sufficiently. Uh, Ah, so okay, by there is upper limit. So by cancellation, we can make it small, but <laughs> we cannot increase it uh, as much. Right, as right, we... right. To increase the sensitivity, I mean, the easier way of doing uh, it would be just increase the number of statistics mm -hmm. or increasing the other parameters like um, spin coherence time or, uh, yeah, or the statistics. Or the experimental time, <laughs> yeah, I see. those okay. kind of things. Yeah. Okay, questions from other audience. Maybe too clear. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, my my final question then. Uh, oh, sorry. So do you, sorry. but still the. The sensitivity doesn't reach the the QCD axon parameter space. Do you You're right. Any any 
factor that can improve the situation. Oh, you mean, you mean, are, are there any um, preferred region? I mean, uh, the, yeah. Um, there's any uh, technical developments or uh, potential possibility to reach the QCXM parameter space? Uh, um, yeah, th that's a good question. I, but I don't think I have an answer at this moment. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. This is a challenging still. Mm. Uh -huh. All right, then uh, let's thank uh, on again. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. And we are going to have a 10 minute breaks and we'll start uh, 510 in Korean Standard Time and 1010 in Central European Time. Okay, see you. See you later. say because it's and because it's a bit late here i'm uh, speaking not very loudly so if you cannot hear me tell me and i will just repeat myself and i'm going to be telling you about the nasa collaboration and using quantum magnetometers to look for ultra light dark matter and while my affiliation is Tel Aviv university some of the work i'm showing you here was done also in the Raphael quantum optics lab and i have many collaborators and as we get to them, I will mention their name. And no, these are two different people. So don't worry about the, the fact that the names look the same like uh, here. So the outline for my talk, first, I will tell you a bit about axion-like particles. Hopefully you guys know about this very well. So I will only give you a brief overview. And then I will tell you a bit more about coherent interaction. I assume some of it might have been covered by the previous talk, but I was sleeping, so I don't know. Then I will tell you about noble outlier common magnetometers. I will tell you a lot about spin-based magnetometry. How does it work? Because this is the tool that I'm using to look for axion-like particles. Then I'm going to be telling you about why noble and why alkali uh, for our devices. And I will briefly go over my old results. I'm not going to go all the way uh, uh, discussing all the things I have here just for the sake of time. And I will focus more on my work with NASDAQ, um, which is the more interesting part. And then hopefully we will also have the time for our conclusions. So. Axion-like particles, we all know them, we all love them. They were originally postulated as a solution to the strong CP problem. Uh, sorry, axions were originally postulated like that. Of course, axion-like particles are very similar to axions, but they don't have to be related to a strong CP problem. They are pseudoscalars. Uh, all our axion-like particles are going to be pseudoscalars, and they can be a cold dark matter component. Throughout my talk, I'm going to be assuming that they are all of dark matter. Of course, they can only be some part of it, and you can easily convert any of the bounds that I will show you to, to what happens if they are only 20% of dark matter or whichever other percentage is your favorite. Now, very uniquely, axion like dark matter can be very, very light and still remain a very, uh, sorry, still remain a cold dark matter candidate. Specifically, I'm going to be talking about stuff that is lighter than four pico EV. So it's very, very, very light. So this was my introduction about axion like particles. Basically, they are a model for, uh, they are very light dark matter candidate. That's what you need to remember. And the interactions that they have with the standard model, there are several possible ones. The only one I care for are the interactions of axion-like particles with fermions. So it's this derivative coupling, GSSI, a derivative of axion times this uh, um, bilinear term, um, sorry, times this term. And the, this is what we're going to look for. Specifically, I'm focusing on the possibility of axions in axion-like particles. I'm going to say either axions or axion-like particles, Assume I'm saying axion like particles. So, axions interacting either with neutrons or with electrons. And the reason why I'm showing you this parameter space that is already quite old, uh, it was before our first paper, is that it shows you very clearly that currently astrophysics is much, much better than terrestrial experiments. The red, uh, the red uh, bands here and the red band here, as well as here, they are coming from astrophysical probes, specifically the cooling of neutron stars cooling of white dwarfs, uh, searches for solar axions, and uh, the uh, new solar neutrino observatory. So these are ast astroparticle probes. And the rest here, these are uh, terrestrial experiments. And the reason why astrophysical experiments are much stronger is that you know stars are a very big thing. Even a small axion, if you wait billions of years, could have large effects. While our lab, you know, we have an experiment that lasts a month. So it's very, very hard to compete with these huge systems. And if we, and the problem is that these uh, uh, astrophysical bounds have a lot of uncertainties. So it's very good if we have some independent probe that can check them. 
And um, of course, the question is, can we actually compete? Because as you see, we're currently losing by a lot. So the way we are going to try to compete is something called coherent interaction. As you can, uh, because we know the uh, density of dark matter, you can easily compute the number density, the number of particles per unit volume. And for light uh, axion-like particles, you can see that this thing uh, becomes larger than the than one over the, the Broglie wavelength. Sorry, the, uh, yes. So that means that you have more particles than one in what you would classically call a single particle. So they are very, very dense. Uh, they have a high number density. And this tells you that, that you can no longer think of them as independent point-like particles. They are much more similar to this giant plane wave that is all around us, okay? So because they are very dense, we can go back to our classical estimate that these particles are just waves. And if you take the non-relativistic limit of their interaction with regular particles, uh, the interaction I showed you earlier, you can see this Hamiltonian. So this Hamiltonian is basically how we are going to try to find the axonic particles. You see that it couples between the, the uh, some, some field that I'm going to be calling the anomalous field, and it's related to the axion, to the spin of the fermion. So I'm coupling it to the spin of the fermions. Um, this field is linear in the coupling constant. Um, and it oscillates according to the mass of the axion. Okay, the reason is that this is a plane wave, so it oscillates with the energy, and the energy of the axion is very close to its mass because it's not relativistic, it's dark matter. So, so this is the, what we call the anomalous field, and it is linear in the coupling constant. And we know that the coupling constant must be very small because otherwise we would have already found it. And the, all the astrophysical probes are usually sensitive to this thing squared or this thing to the power of four. Okay, because it's either production or production and then absorption. So if we have an effect that is actually linear in the coupling constant, then we might be actually able to compete because you know a number, a very small number squared is a very, very, very small number. So because we have something that is linear, we might have a chance. Of course, the question is, can we actually measure this number? Because if it's just like a pretty expression I can write, but I am only sensitive to this uh, uh, field to the power of 22, then obviously it doesn't really help me that I wrote it like this. But as you probably can guess, we are able to measure it. And to understand how we measure it, I need to remind you of something called uh, more precession or and um, Zeeman splitting. So the interaction of the classical magnetic field pointing that way with the spin that is pointing this way is to make the spin want to process around the magnetic field, right hand law. And um, the, this precession is called a more precession. And it has this quantity here called the gyromagnetic ratio, which is some, um, property of each particle. The electrons have a gyromagnetic ratio, the protons have one, etc., cetera. And um, it determines how fast the spin will rotate around the magnetic field. And you can write the Hamiltonian of this uh, kind of interaction. And it's this one. And it is also called the Zeeman splitting because it splits the energy levels so that if you're pointing with the magnetic field or against it, you have two different energies. And just as a reminder from the previous slide, this was our expression for the axon-like particle interactions with, with uh, standard model spins. So as you can see, these terms are exactly alike. And if we can actually measure this one, then we are also going to be sensitive to this one, because you just measure whatever it is that couples to spins. And you might ask yourself, can we actually measure magnetic field? Of course, the answer is yes. People cared about magnetic fields long before they cared about axon-like particles. So they have built devices that can measure this effect. And these devices are also going to be measuring the effect of the axon. So this was my outline earlier. And just so you know, if you, in case you lost me, I'm going to repeat it several times throughout this talk. And basically everything I told you until now, okay, from this part, the red region here, is that ultralight acting like particle, dark matter, generates a magnetic light field. And if you lost me, that's okay, because now I'm going to be telling you how to measure that magnetic field. And we're not gonna go a lot more into this until we get much later. So now how can we measure this magnetic light field that axion like particles generate? So to understand noble alkali co-magnetometers, first I need to tell you a bit about spin magnetometry in general. And the way this works is using the Bloch equations, which are obviously not my own equations, despite uh, the family name. And these are uh, first order differential equations. So on one end, we have S dot, the change in the spin over time. And on the other hand, we have a lot of terms, and I'm only going to be talking about the leading order in important stuff. Feel free to ask me if you think I forgot something, and I might just tell you, yes, you are correct, but for the sake of this talk, it's not very important, so I sort of, you know, let it slide and didn't mention it here. So S dot, the first term is exactly the Lamour precession term. It is built of two terms, the 
regular standard model gamma B cross S and the just B cross S of the, of the what I call the anomalous field or the acting like particle effect. So this is my first term. It generates a torque, okay? It causes you to sort of want to flip. So if let's say you have some polarization pointing in the Z direction, we have a magnetic field pointing in the X, Y plane, it will make the magnetic, the spin start to fall a bit because it applies some torque that makes it want to fall down. So this is my first term. My next term is a term that I haven't mentioned before, <clears throat> sorry, called the decaying excitation term um, or decoherence term or decay term. There are many names for it. What it does is it causes stabilization because if we didn't have it, if all we had was this term, then once you have some spin pointing in some random direction and the magnetic field is not exactly aligned with it, then that spin is going to rotate around the magnetic field forever and ever. So my system is always going to be in motion and it's very hard to follow it, okay? It's gonna be always depending on exactly where it was a moment ago for me to know where it should point next. So this term means that after one over gamma or a few over gamma, <clears throat> my system is gonna reach a steady state. It's gonna uh, reach some preferred direction. However, if all I had were these terms, then that preferred direction would simply have been S equals zero. As you can see, the only stable state, state solution, sorry, is S equals zero. In the end, the spins will decay. However, I have one last term here, which is called the pumping term. Now, the ter this term, which I will call the pumping, is not really coming from exactly the spin system. And I will show you later some ways we can generate it in our systems. And what it does, it creates a macroscopic polarization. <clears throat> if, I, if I assume that S dot equals zero, Earlier, the only solution that I would have had was that S itself was zero as well. But this term, what it does is it means that now my spins can point in a specific direction, even if uh, I wait a long enough time such that uh, things settle down. It creates a non uh, sorry, non-trivial steady state solution. And um, this is important because if you just put spins inside some container, they will point in random directions. And when you try to measure them, you will just measure zero. So you need something that will give them a specific macroscopic direction, which they prefer. And then some of them are going to be pointing in that direction. And I define this term to be, uh, sorry, this direction to be the Z direction. And later I will explain how, how we generate this, our, this uh, uh, pumping term. So these were my block equations, but I don't actually care about the, solu the total solution. What I care for is only the transverse, um, the transverse equations of motion. So, I'm almost always going to be assuming that S dot is equal to zero, S dot Z, sorry, so that the spin in the Z direction is not changing. Now, this is not strictly true um, because the pumping term can have some instabilities and other things can be not exactly stable, um, but these changes are very small compared to the very large SZ that I have. So this is a valid assumption. And I'm also going to be implicitly assuming basically that most of my spin is pointing in the z direction and everything else are tiny perturbation in the x, y direction. I'm rewriting my terms. This part is just aesthetical so that I only have a single parameter. Because even if I assume this thing and I'm gonna assume that the z, the, 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 sorry, the z degree of freedom is non-dynamical, I still obviously have a vector, s, x, s, y. But when I write it like this, it's now a single complex number. So all my equations can be of a single complex variable. Just, it's just much prettier. So. Earlier, these were my equations. And now I can look at the transfer equations and they are these ones, where I plugged in with the fact that, again, S dot Z is zero, so that there is some SZ that is constant, as well as that there, these are just small perturbations. Let's look at the terms here one by one. So now I have the S perpendicular, which is again, SX plus ISY. And I'm looking at the change in time. On, on the right-hand side, I have this term, which is coming from here. And what it does is that if I have some um, magnetic field in the z direction or some anomalous field there as well, then my spins, my transfer spin is going to want to rotate around that spin. And I here means that the x and y directions mix, right? Because if I start out with sx here, then I'm going to get s dot that is negative, that, sorry, that is imaginary. So that means that I'm going to generate a y spin. So this means that it's related to rotation around the z, the re -magne z magnetic field. Now, this other term is obviously also coming from here. And what it does was if I have a lot of spins pointing in the z direction, I have some transverse magnetic field, then it's going to make me want to generate some other transverse magnetic field in a perpendicular direction. This is basically the term, I the thing I mentioned earlier about this torque term, which is that it can generate, um, sorry, it can generate transverse spins 
from transverse magnetic fields and a z-polarization. The last term is obviously just this term. And now that it is in the perpendicular direction, we almost always just call it the decoherence rate or the decoherence term. Note that because the pumping term was only in the z direction, it is no longer present in my equations. So these are now my equations. And note that while earlier I had to have the pumping term to have f dot, uh, uh, z, sorry, to have a non-trivial steady state. Now, even if I plug in that this is zero, I still have a solution which is non-trivial because of my perpendicular fields. So once I have an SZ that is stable, uh, perpendicular fields can generate uh, other perpendicular polarization. So this, this is my uh, equation of motion. And I'm going to be ignoring the possibility of a um, Z anomalous field. The reason is very simple. This DZ is gonna be a very, very big number. So this is gonna be negligible. So my detectors are simply not sensitive to it. There are detection schemes that will be sensitive to it, but not the ones I'm going to be speaking about. So the effect that I'm actually going to be looking for is this effect. Throughout the entirety of the rest of my talk, I'm going to be looking at this equation of motion and trying to find this term. This is what I'm going to be trying to measure. So now that we have our new equation of motion, we can solve it. So this was my anomalous field and this was my equation, new equation of motion, and I'm just going to solve it. When I solve it, I'm doing two, making two assumptions. The first is that BZ is constant. The reason why this is uh, bolded and underlined is that later I'm going to cross out this assumption and we're going to look what happens if you have a magnetic field in the Z direction that is not constant. In addition, I'm going to be doing a four year for this expression. Now, I'm going to be ignoring subtleties that are related to the fact that the cosine function is obviously not equal to e to the i m a t. It has both the positive and negative frequencies. However, this is very much not crucial to our talk. So, and it just very complicates the equations. And if someone later wants, I can show him where this does play a role and where this doesn't, but again, not right now. So this is the equation, this is the solution to, this, to these equations of motion where I just made these two assumptions. We get that the perpendicular spin <clears throat> sorry, is uh, at the frequency of the axon-like particle mass is going to be equal to the amplitude plus the noise or the, uh, sorry, the um, um, magnetic field in the perpendicular direction in the same frequency. Now, because the solution is very, very important, we have an entire slide that is just explaining this uh, uh, solution term by term. So first we have a transfer spin. Everything that I care about is in this term, and this is what I'm going to be measuring in my, in my uh, experiments that I'm going to be showing you later. Next, we have our signal. Now, the thing we wanna measure, which is obviously the XML particle, is entirely encoded here. Last, uh, sorry, next, we have the transverse magnetic fields. There are two reasons why this term can exist. The first one is very simply noise. It doesn't matter how good your detector is, in the end, uh, um, if you have magnetic shielding or a room or anything, there are thermal magnetic noises that are gonna generate small uh, magnetic uh, transverse magnetic field that are gonna um, look like axonic particle signal. So that's why we have this term. But in addition, we will also see later that when you put two different atomic species in the same cell, they apply a transverse magnetic field on one another. So this term can have two different two reasons why it exists. Note obviously that it is proportional to what we called earlier the gyromagnetic ratio. Next, we have the spin in the Z direction. Because both my noise and my magnetic field be, uh, are proportional to it, I have one main demand. Just don't be a very small number. Sometimes it is a very small number, and then you need to worry about other sources of noise. But if it's big enough, then these two terms are going to be my noise and my signal. And as long as I'm, and, and as long as this term is big, I simply it doesn't change uh, um, the ratio between my signal to noise. So this doesn't affect the signal to noise ratio as long as it's big enough. So I don't need to worry about other problems. Next, we have the out mass. Now, um, this out mass is the, the, the reason why it's here is because this is the frequency in which my anomalous fields are oscillating. We are only able to probe ultralight alps. What I'm going to show you is gonna be up to five pico EV. Probably we can extend to a few nano EVs in the future. And if someone really wants to, we can also get to micro EVs, but um, I think that is pretty unlikely. Sorry, because um, it gets very hard to measure such high frequencies in these kinds of devices, but it is very possible in case this is someone's favorite frequency and you really want to be able to measure it. Next, we have the resonance frequency. So the, the, this is mostly determined by an external magnetic field that we are controlling. 
There are some corrections. Like I said, when you put two magnetic speed, two atoms, atoms in the same cell, they're going to affect each other. But for the most part, we control this number and it, it determines which frequencies we are sensitive to. It determines the natural frequency of this linear, uh, um, different or linear differential equation. So in that natural frequency, you have the most response to outside fields. And indeed, this is uh, what we call also the resonance frequency. And it is also proportional to the charge magnetic ratio. The last term that we have here is the decoherence rate. Now, the decoherence rate is a whole story by itself. There are, it can vary significantly between, between different systems, between a millihertz and even a microhertz to a kilohertz or even uh, uh, tens of kilohertz. So it's a very wide range of possible decoherence rates. And the first thing it, it determines is the, the width of this resonance. You see, if these two terms are close, I'm going to be very sensitive. But obviously, when they uh, become apart from each other, I start to lose sensitivity until I need to start to worry about other noise, uh, noise sources. Um, and the, what, what does it mean to be very close? What does it mean to be very far? Of course, the number you need to compare it to is this gamma. So if I'm within roughly one gamma of the resonance frequency, then I'm going to be sensitive. If I'm 10 gammas away, then this is going to be very suppressed and I need to worry about other noise sources. There's another effect that I simply don't have the time to go uh, too much into, um, but there are technical problems if the decoherence rate is small, um, in which basically if you hit your system a bit, it takes hour for hours for it to relax. But we're not really going to cover that part too much. So this was again uh, my outline. I started by telling you that ultralight axions generate this magnetic-like effect. And basically what I told you right now is that by measuring the spins of some system, and now we're going to get into what exactly is that system, we are also measuring axon-like particles. So um, this is, by the way, a good time again to sort of wake up again, because uh, now I'm going to be talking a bit about the experimental system. So in case you lost me or you don't like math too much, um, there's going to be a, a repeat of the math when we get to the here, but for now, let me tell you a bit about um, some shiny equipment, which uh, will hopefully be less uh, mathematically arduous. So why alkali? This was my uh, equation of motion, but, and I told you that I'm gonna have a noble alkali comagnetometer. By the way, a comagnetometer is just a fancy way of saying two magnetometers or several magnetometers, okay? So why do I need an alkali metal? Alkalis are a kind of a metal, right? So I need some way to both generate a spin in the z direction as well as measure the perpendicular spin. I sort of uh, told you that I'm going to explain you what the pump term is later. Now is that later? And I completely neglected to mention the fact that obviously I need some way to measure my perpendicular spins because even if my system does have some effects in these spins, if I cannot measure them, obviously, who cares? So both of these things can be achieved with optical lasers for alkali metals. Alkali metals have optical or nearly optical, uh, well, you know, near IR technically, energy levels. And if you play with optical lasers, then you can affect and measure that system. Specifically, I'm going to be calling the pumping laser the thing that polarizes these. And the way this works is just the pumping laser has a preferred spin direction. And when the alkali metal absorbs the photons of the, of the pump laser, then it gets that preferred spin direction and it creates my pumping turn. And then I have the probe lasers. The probe laser, and um, they are going to be what we call off resonance. So they are not really at the exact energy level where all the alkali atoms are going to absorb these photons. Um, but, but they are close to it. So they do affect the system, but very negligibly. It's something that quantum information people really like. It's called quantum non demolition measurements. But for the purposes of our talk, the probe beam is simply another laser that is able to measure the, the perpendicular spins. And my problem with alkali metals, the reason why this stock is not called using alkali magnetometers, but it's called using alkali noble coal magnetometers, is that our signal to noise ratio, the ratio between how much I'm sensitive to magnetic noise compared to, um, per, compared to my anomalous field is the geomagnetic ratio of the particle. And the geomagnetic ratio of alkali, metal is a very, alkali metals is a very large number. In fact, this is exactly why they're used as magnetometers, because they can measure magnetic fields very, very accurately, because they have a large gyromagnetic ratio. <coughs> Sorry. So um, because this is very large for us, it means that we're going to be very sensitive to noise and only a bit to my signal. So how do we solve this problem? Obviously. This is where the noble comes in. You see, the problem was that our geomagnetic ratio was too big. 
And noble gases, when they, have an, when they actually have a spin, they don't always do. They have a geomagnetic ratio that is smaller by two to three orders of magnitude compared to the alkali. So simply for free, by just using the noble magnetometer, I'm going to be getting a two to three improvement on my signal to noise ratio. However, they have problems. They do not interact with lasers. The energy levels of a noble gas are the nuclear energy levels, which are, I think, roughly at the MeV scale. And I don't know of any laser that is MeV scale. And even if it is, if there is one, it will probably just ionize my system and you know, ruin all my lab and kill everyone inside. So we don't want MeV lasers, um, which is a problem if you want to interact with noble gases. However, luckily, the noble gases can be both polarized and um, I just got to know the participants can now see my screen. Hopefully you could have seen it also before. Otherwise uh, it would have been a bit ridiculous. Um, but, uh, but these noble gases uh, can, also, can both be polarized as well as measured by alkali spin. And the way this works is by using spin exchange uh, uh, interactions. So first let's discuss the polarization. So how do we polarize noble spins? At every given moment when you place in one cell the noble and alkali spin, they are going to collide with each other all the time. And this collision happens very rapidly. So it's not like, you know, some stochastic process where nothing happens and then boom, you have a huge collision and then nothing. No, this process happens all of the time. And you can think of it as some, as some continuous, um, continuous effect of these collisions. And this process of the, of the collision will also generate a spin exchange where if one of the particles is polarized and the other one isn't, or in more, or more honesty, both every individual particle has some polarization and they are go both going to give some of their polarization to the other guy. So as the name suggests, the spin exchange means that every time they collide, they exchange some of their spin. So if you went long enough, you see that the spins of the alkalis are changing to be closer to the spins of the noble. And similarly, the spins of the nobles are slightly getting some of the alkali spin. Now, the first term here, this one is negligible. It doesn't really matter. It affects some of the computations, but it's not critical. The more important term is that now I have a, a pumping term where the noble gases over time are going to get the same direction of the spins of the alkali. So if I polarize all of my alkalis to be pointing that way after uh, some time, which can change depending on the noble metal, sorry, noble gas, the the noble gases are also going to be having the same preferred direction of the alkali metal. So this is how I create the polarization. Now, interestingly, this exact effect, the spin exchange, also can also be used to measure the noble spin. Now, the reason I have the quotation marks is that this measurement is not simply, you know, some uh, uh, digital, uh, I don't know, a monitor that tells me, oh, the spin of the noble is five. It's measuring it by being affected by it. And then we can later infer the spin of the noble. So when these particles are hitting each other, there's this um, magnetic field that is coming from quantum point-like interactions. The reason why I call it quantum point-like interactions is not to sound fancy. It's because there's a similar classical effect, but that effect is very negligible. And this effect is actually related to the uh, overlap between the wave functions of the electrons of the alkali and the nucleus of the noble gases. So this effect is entirely quantum and uh, uh, related to their point lag collision. There's also, like I said, a long range classical effect that we don't care for. And the magnetic field that the normal spins are gonna be feeling is proportional, sorry, the magnetic field that the alkali is going to be feeling is proportional to the total noble spin. Similarly, the magnetic field that the normal is feeling is proportional to the spin of the alkali. And the, the, this means that the alkali is feeling a magnetic field that is affected by the spins of the noble. So if we measure the magnetic field using the alkali, we are also measuring the spins of the noble. So this is basically how this process works. And now, if you want to actually go to the grocery store and buy a common metometer, let me tell you roughly what is the ingredients list. Because this was sort of a bit maybe uh, in the air. So now let's try and look at what, the, what this actually looks like. So first of all, I have a glass cell. Now, this glass cell is usually spherical or cubical. There are other fun shapes you can play with, but these are the main two shapes that people use. This glass um, cell, sorry, when I say glass, by the way, obviously there are other materials that you can use. Mostly there are see-through materials and the exact material changes depending on the properties that you want. Um, but it has some alkali vapor inside of it. 
Now, the reason why I'm saying alkali vapor, not alkali gas, is that there's actually a droplet of alkali metal, of liquid alkali metal somewhere over here. And we can play with how many vapors are inside by changing the temperature of the system, right? This is how vapor, vapors work. You change the temperature, temperature, sorry, and then you get more gas floating, more tiny particles floating around. You make it colder, you get less of them. Next, we have noble gas. Now, noble gases, the reason why I drew a lot more of them compared to the alkali metal is that indeed we can cram inside the cell a lot more noble gases compared to alkali metal. The reason is that alkali metals are very chemically reactive. So if you place a lot of them, the cell simply literally blows up. I have seen it happening. While the noble gases, they are much less chemically reactive. And while if you put uh, several atmospheres of it, it can blow up the cell as well. You can usually cram in as much as a thousand times more compared to the alkali because because um, they are much less chemically reactive. And also this means that they're going to be much more stable and much more, um, um, yeah, much more stable and much less affected by time. It's going to take a very long time for them to feel outside changes. They react very slowly to basically anything. Next. I want to tell you something that I sort of uh, may, may have slipped when I was talking, but uh, um, this is where we actually should address it, which is when I use noble and alkaline metals, obviously I don't really care about the interaction of a whole atom with um, um, an axion-like particle, right? Atoms are not some fundamental particle. As we see, I'm not only looking at fundamental particles, but they are a very complex system. And in the end, the alkaline metals are very nice because they have a single electron in their outermost shell. And that electron uh, determines most of the spin. So when you think about this alkaline metal doing all its things around, when, you, when we measure its spin, what we're basically measuring is the spin of an electron. Okay, so an electron is a fundamental particle, which we care about. So it's nice that we have some uh, way to measure its interactions with something, with the alkaline particle. Next, the noble gases, all their uh, electron spins are pointing in opposite directions. And all of their spins, if they have one, which obviously we're only using ones that do have a spin, uh, comes from the nucleus. And that nucleus, the reason why they have such a small germinate ratio is that indeed the, the germinate ratio is related to the mass of the particle. And all of these guys are we're gonna be sensitive to the spins of their nucleons, e.g., sorry, i.e. electrons, uh, sorry, i.e. protons or neutrons. So when I look at the noble gases, what I really care about is the protons and the neutrons inside of them. Um, and when I look at the alkali, what I really care about is the electrons. Now we have the lasers. As I mentioned, my definition to what is a Z direction is that my pump laser is pointing that way. And by uh, being absorbed by the electrons or by the alkali metal, uh, they are gonna get a preferred spin direction. Then they're gonna collide with nucleons and then the nucleons are also gonna get preferred spin direction. And I also have the probe laser, which as I said, I'm not gonna explain the mechanism of how it works, but if someone wants to know, I'm happy to explain it later, um, which is able to measure the spins of the alkali metal or of the electrons in this direction, which I'm moving my mouse in. I hope you are able to see it, but if not, it's the what I call here the X direction. So I have other miscellaneous things. So if you actually wanna build your own co-magnetometers, you're gonna need some other components. Specifically, for example, we have an oven that is surrounding this entire system. Because as I said, this is alkali vapor. We are below the, the boiling temperature of an alkali metal. So if it's in room temperature, you're simply not going to get a lot of alkali particles that are floating around here. So you need to heat up the system with some oven. This also gives you control over exactly what is the density of the alkali metals at any given experiment. So we have some, you can have some uh, different experiments that are sensitive to different regimes of the system. Next, we have magnetic shields. While, while, while we are able to sort of, you know, get rid of magnetic noise, in the end, you need some sort of control system. And the Earth's magnetic field is much, much larger than any effect that we are looking at. So you need magnetic shields that are gonna give you a somewhat controlled environment, such that other magnetic fields are only a small correction. Next, you have magnetic, magnetic coils. So these magnetic coils allow us to apply a magnetic field that we control. I've, I've already mentioned this earlier, but um, the but we can control the magnetic field in the Z direction also as, the, as well as the X, Y direction. And uh, this is how we do it with the magnetic coils. Now we also have a lot of optical components that are very important in case you wanna build your own co-magnetometer, but uh, they're related to how you shape the pump and probe laser, but they're not very critical for this talk. So this was my first part of the talk, thank the axial particles generate this magnetic-like field. 
And now we are at the second part. Uh, we, this was the second part of the talk. Magnetometers can measure axial light particles, and alkali magnetometers are very easy to work with, but noble magnetometers are much more sensitive. Now, as I said, I, I don't really have the time to discuss, discuss the all the results that we have with Yuni Tochberg, Eric Uflik, and Tomer Volansky. So I'm just going to be skipping this part of the talk. Um, it's just some detector that we were uh, we were using. I'm going to be telling you about the more interesting results, which are our results of, NAT, of the NASDAQ experiment. So the problem with our first result, which again, I didn't have really the time to explain, was that they were starting to lose sensitivity at higher frequencies. We were able to measure interactions of axion like particles, to try and measure interactions of axion like particles, specifically with neutrons, but we were starting to lose sensitivity at higher frequencies. And to solve this problem, oops, sorry, to solve this problem of high frequencies, we started the NASA collaboration, the noble and alkali spin detectors for ultralight coherent dark matter. This is our unofficial logo. As you will see later, I have an even more unofficial logo. And this work most, is mostly going to be describing what I did with Orcats, Orikats, Gil Ronen, and Roy Shacham, and Tomo Volansky. But I'm also going to be uh, mentioning a bit of some future work with Yannick Ochberg and Eric Kuflik. So what do we do in NASA collaboration is we build these quantum magnetometers to try and measure the effects of the app. Um, we have several different experiments. The first one is currently in the advanced stages of review by Science Advances. And we have other fun experiments, such as the NASA Cocoa Mag, which is also relevant for quantum information. We have uh, the NASA modulated experiment. And I built logos for other experiments that we've either already performed or are planning to perform. Uh, these are all actual experiments that uh, I built a logo for. And um, there are many, many things you can play around with, because this is kind of a new field, I would say, in the last few years that people have thought of. So all that stops you is your creativity of what exactly you can try to look for. So this, these are the NASDAQ experiments. Now let's discuss our first experiment, the NASDAQ flow okay, because I'm already running out of time. And indeed, this is my last subject, so organizers don't worry too much. So this was my solution, which I hammered in a lot, uh, a lot about, right? My uh, um, spin is proportional to these terms. And note, and I only care about now the interaction of axonite particles with nuclei. So this was the reaction of the alkali spin where I dropped off the term that is related to axon like particles possibly interacting with alkali metals, okay? And now I'm going to be plugging in, okay, inside this uh, transverse magnetic field, uh, I'm going to be plugging in the effect of the, of the, of the alkali interaction with the noble. So um, again, obviously, magnetic fields are related to noise and are related to the inter, inter effect of the two atoms. And I'm ignoring for a second the noise because I don't really care about it right now for the purposes of the Nasdaq Floca experiment. This is the result that I'm getting. And you'd have to trust me. And if you want later, again, I can go over it and show exactly how I got it. However, I don't care about the numerators here. What I care for are the denominators here. And what we can see here is the multiplication of what I call the alkali response and the noble response. Now, the reason why I have this is that the alkali metal is measuring the noble spin and the noble spin is measuring the axonite particle. So the total response is the multiplication of these two responses. And indeed, you see here the alkali resonance frequency. Uh, um, and here you see the alkali width. And here you see the noble resonance frequency. And here you see the noble width. However, uh, note that the alkali gyromagnetic ratio, I already mentioned, is much larger than the noble one. And the two magnetic fields in the z direction are equal up to some constant. So if I look at high enough magnetic fields, where well, this constant doesn't really play a role, if I apply a large magnetic field, because I want to measure high frequencies, right? This is my resonance frequency, and I want to measure high frequencies. Then you can easily see that you cannot be in resonance for both of these things at the same time. Either this is equal MA, or this is equal MA, but they cannot be equal to MA at the same time. So what this means is that at high frequencies, you start to lose sensitivities because the simultaneous measurement cannot be in resonance for both particles. So the, the way we try to solve this problem is using something called Floquet field. I'm almost certain that T is silent because this is French, but if someone knows better, feel free to correct me. So Floquet fields are basically modulated fields. So we apply a control magnetic field plus an oscillating one with a Floquet amplitude and a Floquet um, um, uh, oscillation frequency. And this means that earlier, when I told you that our magnetic field at some point is not going to be constant, now is that time. The magnetic field is no longer constant, and our previous solution is no longer true. This was our earlier solution for a constant magnetic field. Now I plug in the fact that the magnetic field is changing, and this is what I'm going to get. I'm going to get a train or a series of, of uh, responses at not only the resonance frequency, right, earlier only at the resonance frequency, now I'm 
and also getting it at all of the harmonics of that, uh, of the, sorry, at the resonance frequency plus the um, floquet frequency plus this omega f, as well as plus two omega f and three omega f, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not only getting a response at one frequency, I'm getting a response at that frequency and all of the harmonics of the floquet frequency away from it. Why is this useful? Oh, by the way, there's also some uh, uh, amplitude here that I'm not gonna get into that is related to this BF and the omega f. The reason why this is important is that by choosing a, a flow cave frequency that is tuned to be exactly the difference between the two resonance frequencies of the noble and the alkali, I can get that around my first harmonic, this number, okay, this expression is gonna become this expression. You see, earlier I had this gamma alkali, BZ alkali, but I'm choosing a, a flow cave frequency such, a, such that now I'm getting a gamma noble times BZ noble. So now both the alkali and the noble spins have the exact same um, exact same resonance frequencies. And this is very important because my problem was that at high frequencies, you can be in resonance with both of these guys at the same time. But now I have a way. If the mass is uh, equal to the resonance frequency of the noble cast, both species are in resonance and therefore both are sensitive to, my, uh, to the fields I wanna measure. And this is exactly how the NASDAQ flow experiment worked. Now, we performed roughly 3,000 measurements um, over a period of five months. And in each measurement, we only get bounds for axial-like particles that have a mass that is order one of the gamma of the noble away from, from the resonance frequency. The reason is that you still need a noble to be in resonance. And the noble is only in resonance when you're a few uh, a gamma away. Now, this gamma noble is roughly 0 0.3 hertz, and um, we measured the range from one hertz to one kilohertz. So you can see roughly where we get this 3000 number, right? If you take 1000 over 0 0.3, you get roughly 3000. Now, our sensitivity was limited by noise from our probing. So this means that our magnetic noise, our, sorry, our spin in the Z direction was not big enough. And there was an other, were other noise sources, not magnetic, that limited us. And this was roughly an order of magnitude suppression compared to what we wanted, which is very sad. However, it also makes us happy because it means that you can easily improve by an order of magnitude by just becoming sensitive to what we call the magnetic flow or your magnetic noise. Now, there's a red asterisk here. This red asterisk is a very complicated one because the first thing I wanna say is that while this is not difficult, NASDAQ is not actually gonna do this experiment again, okay? Because we're not gonna build a whole detector again just to try and improve on this. But there is a detector in the world. So this is a shout out to uh, uh, Dimitri Butker, who we know because he published results of it, has a detector that is sensitive to the magnetic floor. So if you just use this method with uh, uh, our, uh, sorry, our method with his detector, we are sure that he will be able to improve our results by roughly a factor of 10, which is sad because people will cite him instead of us, but it's good for the sake of science that you know we can improve our sensitivity and probe a new part of the parameter space. So, you know, conflicted feelings. Now, uh, the NASDAQ uh, flock experiment is actually sensitive mostly to the interactions of isonar particles with neutrons, much less with electrons. And the, the blue line that you're seeing right here is our results. Now, um, <clears throat> sorry, the reason why it's a fancy line, I can also explain it's related to the exact way this method works. But basically, you can think of this uh, little white line in the middle as the bound. You can see but we are still not that close to the astrophysical bound, which are roughly two orders of magnitude better, uh, uh, sorry, stronger than us. However, as I mentioned, you can easily get an order of magnitude improvement just by switching to a detector that is already out there. And you can also um, um, just do a full uh, a measurement that is longer than ours, because we only did, you know, our measurement had some finite time and you can, let's say, uh, make them 10 times longer and get easily a factor of free improvement in your bound. Um, and you can really be right on the edge of the current best astrophysical bounds at the point that I myself would say that I think that uh, the systematic uncertainties in these bounds are already somewhere around here. So you can really cover a region that is only kind of covered by these astrophysical less uncertain, more uncertain bounds. And very importantly, you can also see that we have extended our reach compared to the previous uh, experiment that I didn't have the time to get into to a factor of 10 higher frequencies. So this experiment is indeed does what exactly what we wanted it to do, which is being able to measure high frequencies, uh, which made us very happy. Now, there's one thing um, there's one thing that I'm adding here, which is uh, the result of the Casper experiment, um, which I was planning to cite, but I now see that I actually forgot to add the citation, so I'm sorry. 
The reason why it's sort of shaded and not in my original plot is that they didn't account for the stochastic nature of axonite particles. You see, they are not exactly centered at the axiom mass and they have some width and they didn't account for it yet. And that means that their bounds are sort of better than what they actually are. So it's a bit of an unfair comparison to us. But as soon as they plug in their the these bounds, because they you know, derived how to do this uh, independently from us. We have derived it, they derived it originally, uh, Lissanti and Mochella and Torano derived it uh, and we learned from them. And as soon as they do it, we'll probably be somewhere, let's say around here, a bit uh, worse than us, but it is a valid experiment. And as you can see, they do have a better sensitivity than us in some regions of the parameter space, which will probably remain even after you suppress this bound by a bit because their detector is simply better. They took shorter measurement times and they didn't use our technique, which is mostly relevant for higher frequencies, but at low frequencies, they are simply better, which is why I hope they will also use this technique and be able to measure high frequencies just like we did. Now, there is sort of an open question about the about protons because we don't really know the, how much of the pro, how much of the sorry of our nuclear spin is coming for protons and how much it is for neutrons. The uncertainty of how much comes from neutrons is very small, which is why we can cast bound. While for protons, technically it's consistent with zero, so we don't really want to put uh, real, we in our main plots like here are the bounds on protons because as you can see it, it can change strongly on exactly how we model the nuclear spin of our, our noble gases. But in the future, uh, if someone can measure the, can, sorry, can derive how much protons are inside the, the nuclear spin, that would be very interesting because currently there's a window that no one knows if axions are in there or no, uh, except from supernovae experiments, which are kind of unreliable. And uh, you can see this work because there's a lot of theoretical uncertainties there and the exact mechanism they use to blow up a supernova is not clear that uh, it is valid. So I think this could be a very interesting thing to do as soon as some QCD people are able to tell us exactly what is the spin of a proton doing inside the spin of specifically xenon 129, uh, which is the noble gas period. So this is the end of my talk. I am a bit over time, so there's a bit less time for questions. I'm sorry about that. Uh, first of all, common parameters are offering an unprecedented terrestrial sensitivity to ultralight Alps. The NASA collaboration has already done many experiments, which we haven't analyzed because I'm currently the only one that does the analysis and it takes a while. Uh, but there are also other experiments that we are planning to do, uh, and they are very interesting in my opinion. And with creativity, because this is really a new field. Oh, my battery is about to end, so I will uh, disappear for a second to bring my charger uh, in a second. Uh, so with creativity, you can think of new experiments to run, and we already have several ideas on how to utilize some of our even existing experiments just to, you know, analyze different things. Um, and I think that this really is a new field, and if you have ideas, feel free to uh, pass them by me, and because uh, uh, there's a lot of things you can do. So this is our even more unofficial uh, mascot, our duck matter, which goes to Beaconess School and then becomes Nas Duck Matter. And uh, thank you very much for listening. I'm still listening to you, so feel free to ask questions, but let me just bring my charger. Yeah, thank you very much for an interesting talk, an interesting picture. Um, actually, you don't run out of time. You, you, you underestimate your time. You, your talk is supposed to be uh, until six. Oh, really? I thought I was supposed to be 10 minutes before yeah, because six. Because we then start uh, 5.10. Oh, yeah. that's good then. Yeah, yeah. So okay. anyway, um, uh, so there should be any questions <laughs> from the audience. So you, uh, okay. Ubaldi, Lorenzo. Yeah, I think I have yeah. a question. Maybe a couple. Right. Yeah, that, that's a lot to try to begin with. Huh? Uh, I wanted to ask you, can you go back to your slide where you have the, the, the cartoon of the alkali and the novel gases with the laser poles? Yeah, yeah, yeah. this one. And actually, you, you do not them with the, that one, exactly, right. So I was trying to think, because you were explaining before this, right, that the way I mean, it's important that they scatter one on another, no? I mean, the alkali, the, the novel gas is on the alkali, right? To Sorry, sorry, to repeat. Sorry, you, you want the alkali and the novel gases? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the different atoms to uh, collide, right? Yes, exactly. And that's, the mechanism. that's what you were explaining earlier. That's how you align the spins pretty much, right? 
Yes, exactly. So I was wondering, okay, maybe this is a stupid question. So when you say you have the, the laser pulse, the laser pulse is efficient for aligning the spins of the alkali. Is that also how I should think of this? I mean, pretty exactly. much what's going on. So with the laser, with, with the pump laser, you align, let's say, the electron spins of, of the alkali, but you, exactly. you don't, you're not really affected the nucleons. So that's a completely right. different. And then it's so, the scattering that aligns yeah. everything in the end. Exactly. So the nuclei, okay. so basically, let's say if, if I have helium, okay, there's also xenon in the experiment I showed you. So you would start to affect them if you're um, um, at the UV energies, because these are, there are some uh, electron uh, energies that can absorb this. However, because my spins are based in the nucleus of these atoms, then these will not actually affect the spin of the guy. So they really are much less sensitive to these lasers, and you would need, need lasers with a much, much higher. Uh, uh, frequency, a much, much higher energy by, I don't know, probably six or seven orders of magnitude, something that I don't think exists in, in the world. And even if it does, it will just ionize the glass cell and everything around it. Like, so, so yes, the, the way to think about this is the pump affects the electrons, the electrons affects the nucleon, and uh, yeah, this is the way this thing works. Great, thanks. So, and just another quick question, maybe you, you say this already. So with this uh, experiment, no, with this method, you're saying your probing mass is below roughly 10 to the minus 12 EV, no? 10 to the minus 11, 10 to the minus 12? Yeah. Is there um, any way, like with this setup, uh, I mean, building a new experiment or whatever, that you can go to a higher masses? So yes, so, what, uh, so, so there are one of the logos that you are seeing here, you see this large magnet? Yeah. This is because this is not like high frequency. So there's a much higher magnetic field, so it's high frequency. Um, I obviously, I mean, I didn't say the name, but uh, the point is that there are ways you can um, get to high frequencies roughly by three orders of magnitude. The frequencies that we are measuring here are at the kilohertz, uh, at most one kilohertz. And uh, these kinds of detector can also measure up to a megahertz. So there is roughly three orders of magnitude that you can get. Um, there are some complications about, uh, it's a lot harder to do this with nuclei. You can, you, it's much more sensitive to interactions with electrons, um, but there are some methods that we are looking at into. Sorry. Um, if you want to get even higher than the four nano EV to a micro EV scale, I have talked to some people and we can think of some methods right now. It, we can't think of a good enough motivation because uh, just because it's going to take a very long time to first build the infrastructure to do this. And second, because uh, this is gonna be a resonant search. So you are only going to be able a tiny, tiny, um, a tiny, tiny width every measurement. So it's gonna take a long time if you wanna cover, let's say one gigahertz to 1.1 gigahertz. So while it is theoretically possible, I doubt that we are going to do this. And probably uh, I think there might be other methods that are better. Like some people talk about, think about like, at the milli EV, there are already absorption experiments that people are talking about. At the micro EV, probably not, but I'm not sure that this is the best method. But if it's a really interesting region that we can think we can beat astrophysics, which I don't think we probably can, we might do it at some point. So the answer is three orders of magnitude, I can give you, and I probably will at some point. Six orders of magnitude, probably not. Thanks. So would you explain more about the signal of this master flow cut? So um, you use noble gas. Um, so the signal is related to the transverse magnetization of this noble gas. Yes. Um, and how so the do way we is... distinct, uh, distinguish it from the, uh, the transverse magnetization of the alkali? alkali? So the answer to that is actually pretty simple. We really don't. The thing that generates transverse magnetic, uh, transverse uh, uh, magnetization for the alkali aside from this effect is magnetic noise. And that is a, a pretty major noise source for us. As I said, right now, we haven't reached the point where we are sensitive to it. We are actually sensitive to uh, some problems with our beam, with our probe beam, but, um, um, but, but it is there. And this experiment cannot really distinguish between the two. So if you are measuring something there, you cannot really know if it's coming from just magnetic noise or noble. And then you might say, okay, maybe then you cannot do detection with it. Maybe it's only for bound. However, this is not actually true. 
And the reason is that by this is our response, okay? And if I play around with the resonance frequency, I can change my relative response to magnetic noise versus no versus sorry versus a new field. So while this is not really um, you know an actual experimental uh, procedure, I can tell you that if you actually suspect that you measured some interest, some actual field, then you can easily go back to that specific frequency because individual. This is a resonance experiment, so individual experiments are fairly short. And you can measure there in one resonance frequency. You change it a bit, you measure it again, and you see if your sensitivity looks like it is changing according to the sensitivity to a magnetic field versus a, um, versus a new field, versus a no, an, a no anomalous field. So this way, uh, this experiment, you can distinguish it, but within a given experiment where everything is static, you have a single resonance frequency, you cannot really, uh, you cannot really tell the difference between these two possibilities of a magnetic noise, uh, uh, an anomalous field. This experiment is mostly optimized to be able to measure very high frequencies, but less to distinguish between magnetic noise and uh, anomalous anomalous fields. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? So Ita, you have uh, more time to talk something <laughs> if we have. <laughs> so I do, I, I skipped an entire experiment. Um, how much time do I have? Four minutes. Okay, so let me just show you sort of the, huh? Yeah, four or five minutes. Sure, so let me just show you briefly about the other experiments that, that we, we didn't do, we just used an existing system. Uh, and I think it's very nice the way it works. So earlier in my previous experiment, I showed you the response of to signal. Now I don't care about it. Now I want to do what you said earlier. I want to be able to kill the noise. I only want to be sensitive to signal. So how do I do that? This was the response of the alkali metal to uh, uh, in general. And now I can plug in the, the noble gases response and I'm ignoring back reaction of the alkali, some details, whatever. And this is the response I get to magnetic noise. If I change the magnetic noise a bit, this is by how much the spin is going to move around. Now, the thing that is grayed out is obviously something you shouldn't care about. The thing that is here is what I care about. Let's say I look at very light masses. So I take MA to be zero, and I'm looking at a very, very long-lived or very small decoherence rate for the noble gas, which is a pretty good estimate. So now all I have is one plus lambda M noble, which is some number, whatever, over BZ noble. That means because I control this busy noble, I can tune this so that this expression is exactly zero. I can make sure that my alkali spin is never reacting to magnetic noise. And this is what we call a compensation point comagnetometer. Every noise that the alkali should be feeling from the outside is immediately compensated by the nuclear spin. And uh, there's another effect that we don't have time in five minutes to discuss. And if I have some magnetic noise, and this is a 2D heuristic illustration of this effect, and I can see that both the alkali and the nobles are gonna tilt a bit. However, the total magnetic field that the alkali is feeling is the sum of the induced magnetic field by the noble plus the direct effect of the magnetic noise. And I can tune my outside magnetic fields so that this exactly cancels. So it doesn't matter what it is in leading order, the, the outside magnetic noise, it is always going to be, have zero effect on the spin of the alkali, which is why this detector can distinguish between magnetic and anomalous fields. And you can just do the same exercise with electrons. Uh, uh, Alps that interacts only with electrons and the alpha is gonna tilt, so you can just measure it because this guy is not gonna feel anything. It cannot compensate for. And similarly, if you do it for the spin, that, sorry, for an axon-like particle that only interacts with the nucleus, then you can see that only this guy is tilt. And then this guy is gonna tilt in response. And this actually, if you just carry out the math, you can see that this only not, not only gives you a measurable signal, it also gives you an enhanced signal by roughly a factor of 1,000. So this compensation point commagnetometer is very, very sensitive to axion-like particles that interact with uh, nuclei. And indeed, uh, the first bounds we got are using data that already was out there by the Romais group of Princeton. We owe them a lot. They also helped us build our own detector. Um, and this is the data from some of the students that were there that they published. And it doesn't really matter what they did with their own experiments because they were not looking for acting like particle dark matter. 
if actinide particles, dark matter exists, let's say in this uh, frequency, you will see a peak over here that their detector would measure. Doesn't matter what they were trying to do. And uh, we use these uh, uh, data sets to cast bounds on axion interaction, actions interacting with electron, and more importantly, actions interactions with neutrons. Um, and you can see that even with this data that was we didn't have the raw data, you know, it was meant for completely different things. We are able to get amazing results because this detector can get rid of noise, which was the problem with the other detector that we simply had to live with the noise. Uh, but they can get rid of noise and they are almost reaching the astrophysical bounds. And in fact, there's a new work by Santi Mochella in Toronto that has the raw data. And we were also doing something very simplistic with the stochastic effects of the apps. And they uh, uh, are doing the full thing. And they, after discussing them, we now also do it always, of course. Uh, and they are expected to be improving this by a factor of roughly five, I think. And they would be able to reach new unexplored regions of the parameter space. And because we didn't have the full data, we definitely couldn't do any discovery with this. They could actually, you know, it might be that in this data, an axion was hidden and nobody knew, you know, this data that existed like uh, 11 years already, I think. Uh, so I think that would be a very interesting search that they would publish in the near future. But well, I shouldn't tell them when they should publish it, that they, they are working on it. I know that they are working on it. Uh, and this was the NASDAQ uh, conversation, which I didn't have the time to cover. Um, and yeah, I think it's also a very nice uh, thing. And now my time really is over. Okay. So the last chance to for questions. Yeah, otherwise, then uh, let's thank Itai. Thank you again for inviting me. Yeah, thanks. So yeah, today uh, the sessions are over, and uh, so tomorrow we will start at the same time. So see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you for all the participants. Bye.